In this video, we're going to be looking at creating flowcharts in Tix. To get started, we need to load up the Tix package, the shapes.geometric Tix library, and the arrows library. Now, before we start the document, we need to define the basic components of a flowchart. To do this, we use the Tix style command. First, let's define the block we're going to use for start and stop blocks. We'll name it start stop using curly brackets immediately following the command. Then we'll add an equal sign before a set of square brackets. In the square brackets, we enter all the formatting information. For this block, we'll specify a rectangle with rounded corners. We'll give it a minimum width of three centimeters and a minimum height of one centimeter. We'll also ensure the text gets centered and we'll set both a draw and a fill color. In this example, we've set the fill color to a color that is 30% red mixed with 70% white. Next, we'll specify an input or output box. This time, we want the block to be a parallelogram. To achieve this, we ask for a trapezium and then alter the angles. The rest is very similar. Next, we'll add a tick style for process blocks using a rectangle and a style for decision blocks using a diamond. Finally, we'll define a style for the arrows. For this, we set the line thickness to thick and add an arrowhead and specify the stealth arrowhead. Now we are ready to start building our flowchart. To do this, we use the Tix picture environment. We'll create our flowchart blocks using nodes and the tick styles we defined earlier. Nodes are very powerful as we can easily position them, make them draw a shape, heavily format them and give them some text. In square brackets at the end of the begin command, we specify a node distance of 2 cm. This is so that the nodes we use to build the blocks are automatically spaced 2 cm apart from their centres. To add a node, we use the node command. We then add a label for the node in parentheses. This label is how we refer to the node in the rest of the code. Then in square brackets, we add the name of the tick style we want the node to conform to, along with any other formatting options. Then in curly brackets, we add the text we want to appear in the block before closing the statement with a semicolon. If we now compile the code, you'll see our start block has appeared as expected. Now let's add an input block in below the start block. This time we need to tell the node where to position itself. To do this, we enter below of, followed by an equal sign and a node label into the squared brackets. We could also use above of, right of, or left of if we wanted the block to appear somewhere else. We'll tell it to position itself below the start block. Now let's add in a process block and a decision block. If we compile the code, you'll notice that the gap between the green decision block and the orange process block isn't as big as the other gaps. This is because the decision block, being a diamond, is taller than the other blocks. Therefore, we can manually adjust its position using the Y-shift variable. If we enter Y-shift equals minus 0.5 centimeters, it will move the decision block vertically down by 0.5 centimeters, which should make the gap more regular. Now let's add in two process blocks coming out of the decision block, one below it and one to the right of it. Again, we'll need to alter the positioning using Y-shift for the block below and X-shift for the block to the right. Let's finish off adding the blocks by adding in an output block and a stop block. To finish our flowchart, we need to add the arrows in. To draw an arrow, we use the draw command and then specify the tick style we prepared for arrows using square brackets. We then enter the label of the node we want the arrow to start from, followed by two dashes, and then the label corresponding to the node we want the arrow to terminate at. 
the labels need to be in parentheses and we need to make sure we close the statement with a semicolon. Let's add arrows in between the start block and the input block, the input and process 1, process 1 and decision 1, decision 1 and process 2a, and between decision 1 and process 2b. As we have arrows coming out of a decision block, we need to add some text to these two arrows. To do this, we use more nodes. However, this time, we don't need to use the node command. We just type the word node in after the two dashes and then the text in curly brackets. If we now compile the code, you'll see the text has been added, but not in a very helpful place. To fix this, we specify which of the node's anchors ticks should use to fix the nodes to the lines. To do this, we use square brackets immediately after the keyword node and then enter anchor equals followed by the anchor. For the yes node, we'll use the east anchor and for the no node, we'll use the south anchor. Now let's draw the final arrows in. You'll also notice that the arrow from process 2b to process 1 is diagonal and therefore doesn't look right. To improve this, we can swap the first dash for a bar symbol which will make the arrow go in a vertical direction before going in a horizontal direction. The final thing we should discuss is the text width. At the moment, all our text fits nicely inside our shapes. However, if for example, we add some more text to process 2a, you'll see the shape just extends horizontally until the text fits. This now becomes a bit messy. To improve it, we can specify the text width for these nodes by entering text width equals followed by a length into our tick styles. This concludes our video on creating flowcharts with ticks. In the next video, we will look at drawing electrical circuits. Please do subscribe to our channel by clicking the on-screen link and keep in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter and Google+.